Psalm 43. Obviously, it's only five verses long, not a very long psalm. Uh, there are a couple main points that we're going to hit while we go through this. So verse number one is one of those main points here. The Bible reads, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation, or deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. And this is not something new. Even while we've been going through the book of Psalms, there's been other Psalms that we've already looked at in the past where we have a similar concept of the psalmist going, Hey, judge me, O God. And this is important to go over, I think, again tonight. And we're going to look at, turn if you would real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because the righteous person is going to be the one who's going to want to stand before God's judgment. The righteous person is going to be the one who's willing to say, hey, judge me, God. And here's the thing. This is something that we all ought to be striving to be able to do. Maybe you're not at the point in your life right now where you'd feel very comfortable going to God and say, God, judge me, right? And obviously, on one hand, we should always have trepidation and fear and have a godly fear, I believe, every day of our life. And the way that the attitude is that, that, a, that a Christian ought to have is one where... You know, you're looking real closely at yourself in a way where, where hopefully you'd be harder on yourself than other people would be on you because you're striving for excellence. We're striving for perfection. We're striving to just be the best that we can be. So when you look internally, when you're looking at your life, you're saying, how can I do better? There's always ways to improve. There's always ways to do better. I feel like I'm failing in areas. I feel like, you know, but what am I going to do? And, you know, the point isn't just to be like, oh, man, what was me? I'm all depressed because I'm such a big failure. The point is to say, hey, I want to do better here. I want to improve. Now, whereas some people might say, hey, I think you're doing great. Right. Like my wife will say sometimes, man, I feel like I didn't get anything done. I feel like it was such a bad day. It was a waste of and I go, look, you did this and this and this. And I'm pleased and I'm satisfied. But from her perspective, she's saying, but I could do so much more. Right? And this is the way that we ought to be with God because there's many times where I think God is still pleased with us, but that we can do and find ways to do a lot more. And we want to be in a position where we could confidently go unto the Lord and say, hey, God, I'm going through problems because here, look, he says, plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Right? There's this ungodly nation out there and I'm suffering as a result of that. There's inequity going on here because I'm doing things right. I'm doing things the way I'm supposed to, yet I'm still suffering as a result of this wicked nation. So you could say, God, judge me. Am I right in this? Is this is, is, am I doing the right thing? And be confident in knowing that you can say, yeah, God, judge me. And then bring your justice to the situation or whatever so that way I can be you know, rewarded or recompensed and that I could be delivered. He says, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Now, in order to be able to confidently go to God and say this, guess what? You've got to be living pretty righteously. You've got to be doing right things. You can't be living in a way where you're going like, oh man, am I just, you know, is this just a result of all my sin? You know? And if you're worried about that, to, you know, if you know, if, and here's the thing, you know whether or not you're in sin the vast majority of time. Obviously, there are sins of ignorance that can happen, but the vast majority of time, especially the more you read your Bible, the less ignorant you're going to be on sin. And the longer you've been reading and the more you understand, you should be growing and getting to a point where you can know and say, you know what, I'm doing right. No, I'm not perfect. Yes, I sin sometimes, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm doing right. Where you could, you, could, you could get to a point where you're saying, I'm being a good son to the Heavenly Father. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Could I be doing more? Yes, but I'm still walking in a way where if I go to God and ask Him for something, He's going to be pleased to, to answer me and to deliver me and to help me and to uh, be able to judge me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this concept of just, you know, first just looking inwardly and judging ourselves so that we can be confident in going to God and say, God, judge me. 
uh, there's a good passage here. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the uh, taking the Lord's Supper, about communion. And uh, we're not going to get all into that, but there was some, some issues going on here at the church. But he's just explaining here the, um, you know, the examination of yourself because when you, when you partake in the Lord's Supper, it's a, it's a holy thing. It's a, you know, you're, you're, represent, you're, you're symbolically representing the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's a somber event. It's something that you take very seriously. You don't do it flippantly. It's not something that you're, you're eating and drinking just to satisfy your own fleshly lusts. It, it's literally a moment to, to reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for you and how he, you know, literally his body was broken for you and his blood was shed out for you and all that he did. So that, that symbolic event when you participate in that is a serious one and it's one that, that there's no joking around and it's also one that you ought to be prepared for when you participate in it the same way that in the Old Testament, you know, people would be unclean until even if they did things that would make them unclean. In many cases, they couldn't do, they couldn't partake in sacrifices and in, in, in um, eating. And, and if the, you know, if a priest was, was uh, unclean, they couldn't do the service. You know, there's all these things where God says, no, you have to be clean. And they're obviously representative. But when it came to, and I don't want, again, I wasn't planning even going this deep on, on, the, on the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb, even when people were unclean, they were allowed to still partake with, with some of you know, if they were unclean by the death of a man. That was the one sacrifice they were still allowed to do. That was symbolic of, you know, I think because Jesus Christ is, is that Passover lamb, that anyone is able to come to Christ and receive Christ and receive that atonement through Christ, um, no matter what condition you're in. I think that's what that represents. But at the same time, we see a teaching here of examining yourselves before partaking in that communion. And look down at verse number 26 here in 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible reads, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this is a very serious thing to consider, right? You're saying, hey, if you're eating unworthily, then you're going to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, first and foremost, you know, who, who is worthy? Nobody is worthy as far as just humanly speaking with our own righteousness to partake in this. Um, but what makes us worthy is going to be being saved, being a child of God, being in Christ, Obviously, that washes us of all of our sins. So on the one hand, you have that, um, you know, definitely unsaved people should not be partaking in this, this representation, this memorial act of what Jesus did when your faith isn't even on him. Right? I mean, that just makes sense. Like, don't be doing this if you're not a believer. Um, and let, let's keep reading here. Verse number 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And notice, it's examine himself. You, you know, I'm not examining the person who's taking and eating of the bread. You're not examining other people going, oh, I don't think they should be eating. You examine yourself. And so when we, you know, uh, observe communion here, it's up to the individual and the, and the head of the household to determine who's going to be participating. And really, you're examining yourself. And it says, And so let me that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30 says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So there's literal physical repercussions for people eating and drinking unworthily. He's saying, This is the very reason why there's sick and weak people among you, and many people, when it says sleep, it's talking about dying. Like this is, this is what's happening as a result of not respecting the Lord's body here. Now, I personally believe that eating and drinking unworthily goes beyond just being saved or unsaved. I think we ought to be in a good standing, you know, relatively speaking with the Lord and not just involved in like a bunch of sin. And you know you're involved in a bunch of sin and still partake in that. Um, I'm not extremely dogmatic about that, but that's the way that I view this as well, because he's talking about all these people in the church 
that are weak and sickly. So they're not all dying, but some are weak, some are sickly, and some are dying. And he's talking to the church. The church is supposed to be a place that's full of believers, right? Obviously, there could be some unbelievers in the church. There, are, there, there will be, probably, in, especially in bigger churches. You're going to have some people that come in, they're unsaved. But in general, this teaching that's, that's going on here, I don't think he's just referring to just unsaved people in the church. I think he's talking to believers that are being too flippant with the, with the discernment of the Lord's body and that they're just kind of being very, you know, we see in this example too how kind of you've got people just eating before other people and some are, are, um, are drunken and some are, you know, they're, 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 not, they're not doing this at all for the right reasons whatsoever. They're coming in more to fill their belly, belly and be satisfied, and they're not waiting for other people. They're not doing things decently and in order. And because of all of that, they're suffering consequences for it. Because they're really, they're really doing disservice to the holiness of this event, of the memorial of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Obviously, this is the verse that I'm driving to in the context of everything, it's this looking to yourself, examining yourself. And if you can judge yourself and judge yourself honestly and truthfully and just be able to look at yourself, you know, you're going to do really well in not being judge of others because if you could already deal with things internally, then you don't have to worry about it coming out later. And here's the thing. When you look at yourself internally, you know your own thoughts, you know your own desires, you, you know you know where sin could be starting and, and starting to develop and, and, and you have an opportunity to head that off before it actually becomes maybe a physical action or something that you actually do. Just about every sin that you do is going to start off somewhere internally before it manifests itself outwardly. So people who, let's, I mean, let's just go through a few examples, right? Just think of a sin like stealing, right? Theft. Normally, what you're going to have prior to somebody taking something that doesn't belong to them is going to be some covetousness. There's going to be some, some things inside of you who are going to be thinking, man, I really want this and I don't have enough money and I can't afford this or whatever, but I want to have that. And you're thinking about things that you can't have. And when you can identify that and say, you know what, that's being covetous, you can stop that in advance. You could judge yourself before you even get the opportunity to go off then and then steal from people. And now you could be judged of others, right? How about fornication or adultery, right? That should be a pretty easy one. You're already thinking about someone or you've got your eyes on someone and you could be thinking about things that maybe you ought not to be thinking of before you actually go forward with committing an act. And we could go on and on and on, drinking and drugs, and you're going to be coveting and lusting after these desires to, to, to be in an altered state of mind or to, to forget about problems or whatever it is. You, know, you could be thinking about these things before you actually do them. This would be very rare that you just kind of stumble into sin where it's not thought about at all. It does happen. I'm not saying it just never happens. But by and large, look, if you're able to uh, judge yourself and look inside and, and handle and deal with things before they get out of control and before they manifest into other sins, then, then you won't be judged. Judge yourself so that you're not judged and you won't be judged by other people. Um, it says, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And see, as believers, as sons of God, as children of God, thankfully, we have a Lord that's going to chasten us Amen. and to help it not get too far out of control. And if, if, we can, if we can hearken to the chastening, if we can listen to the beatings that we get, that, that's another incentive to help us stop, right? If, you're, if you weren't able to judge yourself well enough, God will step in and say, okay, it looks like you need a, a stronger reminder here to get back on track. Um, and obviously we should be hearkening to that and not just continuing to stiffen our neck and go in the wrong direction. But, um, you know, getting, getting ourselves to this point, turn over, if you would, real quick to 1 Peter chapter 3. A 
of getting to this point in our lives where we can say, judge me, O God, right? Plead my cause for me. Defend me. God, be there for me because you know I'm doing right. I know I'm doing right. This nation is ungodly and they're going to come after me for reasons that are not right, that are not legitimate, where I didn't do anything wrong, where I haven't sinned, where, Lord, I'm, I'm just trying to follow your word and your laws. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man because they abound in wicked nations. They're going to be all over the place and they're going to hate you because you're righteous. They're going to hate you because you believe the Bible, because of what you do. 1 Peter 3, I, I think, is an awesome job of explaining, again, the, the attitude mentality that we should have. Um, verse number 12, the Bible reads, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. God's willing to listen, right? So if, you could, if you're willing to say, judge me, O God, and you can do that in integrity, and you can do that in honesty in your heart, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. He's, he's ready to hear. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And this is the way, you know, basically it's teaching us, look, the eyes of the Lord is over the righteous and he's going to hear your prayer. So be righteous and who's going to be able to do anything to you if you're righteous, if you're, if you're walking with God? You know, who can do that? But if you are suffering, even though you're living righteously, he's saying you can still be happy and don't worry about what people can do to you. You're still walking strong with the Lord. So while he may be allowing you to suffer for his sake, don't doubt, don't be bothered by it. You can still have happiness and joy and then be ready to ask people, like when people see, man, you're, I mean, you're being drugged through the mud. You're, you're having all kinds of problems. We can, you know, other people can be able to see the persecution that you're going through. How could you have such a good demeanor? How can you be still having joy? How is this not bothering you? How are you not shaken? And you'll be ready to give an answer unto those that ask you of the hope that is in you. You say, hey, because I didn't do anything wrong because I'm walking with the Lord because I know that God is with me and that God will defend me even though I'm suffering right now. I have hope in the Lord because his word is says so because and you could go to first peter chapter three and be like this is why and this is my answer verse 16 having a good conscience right you have a good conscience when you know you're not in the wrong having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in christ so you may be falsely accused against and, and people lying about you and saying you're doing all this wickedness but if you could stand in a good conscience, you say, hey, you know what? They're going to end up being ashamed because no matter what they try to throw at you, it's not going to stick because you're not guilty, because you're living righteously. And ultimately, God will be there to plead your cause for you because he knows the truth. But the key to all of that is being righteous <laughs> so that it all is true, right? Don't, don't just start applying things to yourself in the Bible where you're like, man, I'm guilty of all kinds of things and, you know, serious sins or whatever that you're going to be like not in the same situation where you could have a good conscience. You know, people got to start saying like, yeah, I saw so-and-so getting drunk and gambling and everything else. Well, if they're lying about you, you could have a clear conscience. Be like, that's not me. I didn't do that, right? But if that's true, <laughs> this isn't going to apply to you anymore. Verse 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Right? If you're going to suffer at all, and, and you know what? We will suffer as believers. So you better make it for good, for well-doing and not for evil-doing. If you suffer for, for evil-doing, I mean, you're just getting what you deserve. But if you suffer for well-doing, God sees that and God sees the injustice 
and God will make it right in the end. And you actually get rewarded later for being going through that, uh, that unjust whatever situation it is, whatever persecution you face, suffering for, for um, well-doing. Verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ gave the example of being the one that suffered for us and, and, and was righteous, completely righteous in everything that he did, yet he suffered for us. Let's continue on here in Psalm 43. Verse 2, For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? And this is something that, that we're going to see. We've already seen, excuse me, a couple times in, in the 40s, Psalm 40s range, you know, the, the questioning, you know, why do you cast me off, God? Why, you, you know, why has this happened? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And this is a very human response when things are not going well. But in every single psalm, we see that there is no real reason to doubt or to, to you know, even ask the question to the Lord. This is a real uh, a feeling here that people have. It's a real emotion and it's something that you may think, but that this, these questions are always answered in, well, of course he didn't cast us off. Of course he's still there, right? It feels that way when you're going through it, but he is there. Verse number three, I want to spend actually... Uh, this is the second main point I want to focus on where the Bible reads, Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Of course, the Bible says, send out thy light and thy truth to the Lord. Here's so he's speaking to the Lord saying, hey, send out the light and truth. Why? Because I want them to lead me. I want your light, I want your truth to guide me and to lead me. Well, the Bible says in Psalm 119, which is all about the law of the Lord, essentially, 119 verse 105 says, the, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if you are saying, hey, God, send out your light and your truth, I want your light and truth to lead me, then we ought to be looking to the word of the Lord for that light, for that lamp to lighten your path. And why is it important for your path to be enlightened? So that you can see where to go and what to do and which way you need to go. I mean, if you're thinking about the path of life, whatever direction you're going to take in your life, you want to know where to go. What's the right direction? Well, the Word of God will illuminate for you and help you make the choices that you need to make in this life. I mean, these are the words of life. Not only because of your eternal salvation, not only because of the main focus, which is on Jesus Christ and leading men to salvation, that is the most important and the main and primary focus of the light, but it's more than just that, because we also still have this light to use as our guide to, to lead us in the right path and out of sin and out of, you know, it's so simple. God makes things so simple for us. You know, man you know, oftentimes thinks we're so, we're so complex and we have all these, these great complicated ideas and stuff, but at the end of the day, for man, it just seems really hard to even get the most basic things down. Like, like we think we're so smart, but the most simple things become a problem. What am I saying? What do I mean by that? Look at the laws of the Lord. Are they really complicated? Does it take a lot to just understand the Ten Commandments? Or the other commandment? We go through, we were just looking at Leviticus 18 through 20. Like, are those really complicated things? No. They're all black and white. It's all real easy to understand. So why do we have such a hard time obeying? Why have such a hard time following? And it's not even like. I mean, I, I know because we're in his flesh, it's impossible, but you'd think like it shouldn't be impossible. It, sh it shouldn't be. Unfortunately, we have a flesh that just drives us to sin, but it's not like it's so complicated where you're just like, oh man, I didn't realize. Like, like I was mentioning how our laws today, you know, you can be breaking the law and just not even knowing it just because there's so many laws and it's just like, man, how, you mean that's a law? I mean, I can't do that. You know, whatever. It's just, yeah. You're, God's law isn't like that. I mean, you really just have to be completely ignorant and never have read the Bible to just to not understand that certain things or sins are wrong.
But you think about if, if the Bible is also only, only, only about salvation and nothing else, you know, why does it have so many other practical <laughs> truths in it? I mean, why does it have Proverbs in there? Why does it have the law? You know, there's so many things in here that just go beyond just salvation. So the law, the, the word of God is the light that we look to. And here, sending the light. Well, um, the Bible also says, Jesus said in John 17, you could turn, if you would, to um, John chapter 8. Actually, no, no, I take that back. Don't worry about going to John. Go to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. John 17, John 8, real, real famous passages. The Bible reads in John 17, 16, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So in Psalm 43, we're seeing, you know, send out the light, thy light and thy truth. Well, in Psalm 119, we saw that the wor thy word is a lamp. So thy word is the light. And then we see that thy word is truth also. So when he's saying, send out thy light and thy truth, hey, send out your word. That's the source of light and truth. That's what we're looking to for this. When we're asking God, hey, send out thy light and thy truth, let them lead me, be led by the word of God. John 8, 12, the Bible reads, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And we know that Jesus Christ also, we saw these verses that say, thy word is truth, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. But Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. So just as much as the word of God is the light and the truth, Jesus is the light and truth because Jesus is the word, the word made flesh. Um, so following Jesus and following the word of God are synonymous. And that's an important point because a lot of people today, a lot of Christians, or at least so-called Christians will say, well, I just want to follow Jesus. So I just want to be like Jesus. I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus. I don't, you know, I don't think we need to get that deep into the Bible and, and you know, read that Old Testament and everything else. Look, Jesus Christ is the Word. The Word is truth. Jesus is truth. They're not two different truths. They're not two different lights. It's all one. If you're following the Word, you're following Jesus. If you're following Jesus, you're following the Word. You cannot separate the two just as much as you can't separate, you know, if you believe on the Son, you have the Father also. Because if you don't believe the Father, you don't have the Son. If you don't believe the Son, you don't have the Father. You can't separate the two and say, well, no, I'm only, I'm only believing in the Father, not the Son. Well, you've got a different God altogether then. You cannot, you cannot separate the two, just like you can't separate the word from Jesus Christ. It's inseparable. But what I really love about this verse, right, because this seems real basic, right? Well, yeah, the light, the truth, let them lead me, of course, Pastor Burzins. Everyone teaches that you should let the Bible lead your path and, and guide your way. That's real simple. But I like where it leads you. Look at what it says. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill, unto thy tabernacles. So yes, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Yeah, I'm going to take a minute and talk about the importance of church. Of physically, literally being in church. Because we see in Psalm 43, he's saying, hey, send out thy light, send out thy truth. Let them lead me. Where are they going to lead me? Let them bring me unto thy holy hill, to thy tabernacles. Where does he lead to? To the house of God. When he's talking about thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles, it's the place where God dwells. It's God's house. It's too bad that more people don't have this mindset to let the light and truth guide them. And again, in, in today's society, we live in a day where everyone wants to just do everything online and people are becoming more and more socially distant in the sense where they don't want to even communicate with people anymore. And I understand the appeal. I don't always like dealing with people. I think it's easier to order, you know, things on the internet and have them delivered to your house and you don't have to deal with anybody. But you know what? Church is important. 
You can't just, just home deliver church and just, and just think that you're getting everything you need. Just because we're live streaming a service tonight doesn't mean that you can just sit at home and think that you're in church while you're listening to preaching and listening to singing. Even if you're singing along at home, guess what? You're still not at the house of God. You're still not there. We do this, we do the live streaming to reach more people, one, to expose people to, to, to our church and to what we're preaching, expose them to the truth, and also as a benefit for people who are part of our church that, that really can't be here, whether they're sick at home or they're just way too far away or whatever. Hey, this gives you an opportunity, but it's, not, it's still not being in church. You can feel a little bit more connected. You can hear what's going on and, and you can you could, you know, get uh, something but it's not being in church. And the people who think that it's good enough for you to just always be at home and never bring your rear into church, you are not letting the light and the truth of God lead you. You're not, because you know where that's going to lead you? It's going to lead you to the house of God. And if it hasn't led you to the house of God, you're not letting it lead you. Don't tell me that church isn't important. Look at verse 15, 1 Timothy 3 again. But if I tarry long, thou mayest know how, how thou also behave thyself in the house of God. That's what we're talking about. The house of God, which is the church of the living God. The house of God is the church. In the New Testament, this is what we're seeing. Old Testament, Psalm 43. Hey, remember your tabernacle. What's a tabernacle? It's a tent. It's his house, right? It's a dwelling place. New Testament, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And not just that, the pillar and ground of the truth. Pillar and ground of the truth sounds like a pretty important place to be. So if you're following, if you want your, your path to be led by truth and by light, it's going to bring you to the pillar and ground of the truth. Saying, here's where you need to be. Get in church. This is the pillar and ground of the truth. And if you're going to let that, that word lead you anywhere, have it lead you here. Have it lead you directly to the house of God. Flip over, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. I had a great question on Sunday trying to answer, well, what do you do when the person says, um, you know, well, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst, right? This is the classic verse that the people who don't want to go to church will use as an excuse to not go to church and to justify their sin, yes, sin of not going to church. Yes, it is a sin not to go to church. You didn't, I didn't stutter. You didn't hear that wrong. Okay, it is a sin not to go to church. To forsake the assembling of yourselves together is a sin. Now, I'll let you decide what God considers forsaking the assembly. That's up to you to determine what that is because God doesn't spell it out it's this many times a week he doesn't say it's you have to go this many times a month or this many times a year and if you don't do that minimum then you're forsaking the assembly and I think he doesn't give us that for a very good reason because he doesn't want you focused on the minimum he doesn't want you focused on what is the least that I could possibly do to not sin here's what he wants you focused on he wants you focused like the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, where is what I'm saying, uh, forsaking the assembly of the sin, he says, let us consider, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more. So he doesn't want you to focus on how little can I go where I'm for, not forsaking. He wants you so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as time goes on, as time gets farther and farther away from the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, far, and more and more close to the, to the day, the day of Christ, the, 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 the end of the world approaching, he wants you so much the more in church. He wants you so much the more provoking one another unto love and to good works. So much the more. So you decide what he's going to consider forsaking, but I'm going to be focused on how much more can I be here? How much more can I be in the house of God? How much more can we assemble ourselves together? 
And you say, Pastor Burson, so why do you say it's a sin? Because in the next verse, he says, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. He's talking about sinning willfully right after, literally right after he says, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because when you're not coming to church, you're sinning willfully. It's your choice. And you're saying, nope, I'm not going to go. Nope, I'm not going to go. And look, I'm not talking about because you're sick. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the rare occasion that happens that's going to, that, that makes sense not to be around other people. We're talking about here a habit of whether or not you're going to church or something, like whether you're just going to church at all. It's like, it's like you know, people who are uh, in need of alms because they physically can't work versus the bum that, that, that is completely able and just doesn't want to work, right? The people who are sick at home and can't come to church because they're sick or they have, you know, there's some reason that's literally preventing them and, and they're unable to make it versus the people who, they've got a car, they've got gas, they've got everything, but you know what? They're choosing not to come. Because they're lazy, they don't want to wake up in the morning, it's too far to drive, or whatever the case may be, they're just choosing and go, well, I know I can do it, but I'm just not going to do it. It's sinning willfully. Church is important. So, you know, the person who thinks, oh, we're two or three are gathered together in my name, they're mine in the midst, I say, amen, because that's true. That was Jesus saying, hey, if two or three people are gathered together in his name, then Jesus will be there in the midst. But does that say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there is church? No. Now, church literally means a congregation. So it doesn't mean that it has to be in a specific type of building or even in a building at all. There is an assembly that meets. There's a congregation that gets together of believers. That is literally the church. But in order not to forsake the assembling, you've got to know when is the assembling. First of all, you're going to have set times because how else are you going to know when there's an assembly happening? And especially, you know, now it's like, oh, well, we could all just text each other or call each other. Well, how did they do it then? You're not picking up a telephone and calling people and going, hey, we're all going to gather together tomorrow. I mean, you, you get, you're going to have to physically gather together. Just, just think about this reasonably, right? They had established times to meet. It was already set up. It was already planned. Hey, the first day of the week, we're all going to gather together. We're going to congregate. We're going to assemble. We're going to sing praises unto his name. We're going to hear teaching and preaching from God's word. And that is church. That is church. And, you know, as I was thinking about this and explaining this to someone who was asking a question, church isn't something that you can specify, well, it has to have this many people, right? Because you can have very small churches. You could even have a church that doesn't have a pastor. You don't have to have a pastor to be a church, to be a legitimate church. Now, if you don't have a pastor, there's something lacking in that church. There's something wanting. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Titus, said, hey, for this reason left I thee in Crete because he needed to uh, um, satisfy the things that were wanting. He needed to ordain elders in every city. He needed to ordain elders in all these churches that didn't have elders because it was lacking. And he said, this is a job that you need to do because this is important because those churches are lacking. They need leadership. They need somebody ordained to lead the church. There's a, there's a void but, you know, you can still have, but there's still churches, right? When it comes to a church, even though you may not be able to write down very specifics exactly on how a church is, you know it when you walk into one. You know when you're in a church and when you're not. When I'm at home with my family and we're eating dinner, you, that's not church. Now, there's two or three, you know, even more. There's eight gathered at my house when we sit down to eat and we pray. We're gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ and we give thanks for the food that we have and we pray to God and sometimes we'll even listen to the Bible. Okay? But it's not church. 
And I'm a pastor of a church, right? So you've got an elder, you've got Christians gathered together, we're eating dinner, we're listening to the Bible, and it's still not church. If anyone were to show up at our house and say, hey, come on in, join us for dinner, they're not going to be like, hey, it's great to be in this church. You see what I'm saying? You know church when you're in one. You may not be able to identify and, 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 and you know, explicitly state all of the details of what a church is and what a church isn't because there's overlap on things. But you know when you're in one. It's kind of the best way to put it. You, you realize when, when you're gathered together and you got an assembly as opposed to just other things. So gathering together, even in the name of Jesus, doesn't make it church. But my advice when people bring that up First of all, I don't like going down rabbit trails and, and getting off of the gospel, right? But if I'm going to deal with it at all, instead of, you know, trying to explain the details of a church and everything else, I usually say, oh, really? So that's your church. So who's the pastor? <laughs> Just go down that path. Uh, well, uh, oh, wow. So everyone's a pastor, huh? Yeah, how many elders do you have? And then you could go down the list in Scripture and say, well, wow, so they're, they're the husband of one wife. They're not a novice. They rule their house well. They have their children in subjection. They, you know, because these places, people who think that way, they don't have that. That's, and, and then you can say, and, and who ordained them? Who ordained these elders? Nobody. But the reason why you don't go down the rabbit trail that far with them usually is because they're either not saved or not going to get it, or they just want to justify their sin. And you might be able to give them one or two admonitions, and then that's it. But um, look, you're in, did I have you turn to Ephesians 4? Yeah. Ephesians 4 is one of my favorite places to turn to when I do go out soul winning to, to try to you know, encourage people to come to church, especially after they get saved to show them the importance of church because church is extremely important. As we saw in Psalm 43, if you're letting the truth and light guide you, it's going to lead you to the house of God. Here's another reason why church is important. In verse number eight, wherefore he saith, when he ascended uh, up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Look at verse 11. And he gave some apostles. This is talking about the gifts, right? Because earlier in the passage is talking about um, gave gifts in verse 8. So we started there. Gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So God is giving these things. God is giving men these different gifts to perform these various functions, to fill these various roles. Why? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of these things are not going to happen or not going to be done except you have a man that's received a gift from God to be able to help do these things. The perfecting of the saints is not going to happen by you staying home and staying in your house and never going to church. It's not going to happen. The work of the ministry is not going to happen when you're staying at home and staying away from other people. You think that you're going to be doing all this soul winning and all this ministering to people and helping people out and do all that stuff. When you're not coming to church, guess again. You may be able to maintain something like that for a short period of time, but in the long run, you will fail. You will not continue. You need church. Look, this is the way that God designed it. And this is just, I mean, you could just see this happening. I see it happening. You know, we've had people come and go through this church. I want to know where are the people that started with this church and aren't here anymore. How much are you doing for the Lord? What are you doing right now? Are you, are you ministering? Are you per being perfected? How about edifying the body of Christ? Well, how well can you edify the body of Christ, which is the local church, when you're not in the local church? Right. 
Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Knowing, look at, look at notice there, not being children, but growing up. You know what church is going to help you do? It's going to help you to grow up spiritually. Church is the additive to your spiritual life that you need for growth to happen. And you know what? I've met people time and time again that have even just listened to a bunch of sermons online but were not going to church. And it's amazing because at first, you, could, you, you know, I've kind of thought, I've met different people and look, I'm not even thinking about anyone in particular right now, okay? But I've met a lot of different people where at first I'm thinking they must be pretty far advanced in their spiritual life because they've heard so much preaching online and they can answer right and speak of some things. Wow, you, you know, you seem to know a lot. And then come to find out, it's like, oh, wow, you're like way still have a lot to learn and a lot to grow. And I kind of assume that people are far along and it's like, there's sin, there's this, there's that, there's all these different things. And it's, and it's, to me, it just demonstrates that even just listening online is not enough. It's not enough. You need to be participating. There's something about physically being here in the presence of others, in the presence of other like-minded believers that you just simply cannot receive externally. You're missing something. You're lacking. Church is important. And, you know, when you can show new believers at the door, hey, look, coming to church is going to help you not to be deceived by other people. There's a lot of people out there teaching all kinds of different things. There's a lot of people on the internet teaching all kinds of different things. There's all kinds of wolves in sheep's clothing. How are you going to know, hey, come to church. You'll grow up spiritually. And you know what? God designed it that way by giving gifts unto certain men to be able to help you to grow. Tell me that's not what Ephesians 4 is teaching. It's exactly what he did. He's using man to help you to grow spiritually so that you don't be deceived. And it's the wicked people and the wicked attitudes, like I just preached on Sunday, the Korah, Dathans, and Byrams. Oh, you take on too much. Hey, we all have the Holy Spirit which is going to lead us and guide us all in the truth. What do we need you for? What do we need a pastor for? What do we need someone, some know-it-all to come up and teach us anything? You're no different than anyone else. We could all just read the Bible and just learn on our own. Yeah, go ahead, read the Bible, learn on your own. I encourage that. But I think the Bible teaches right here in Ephesians 4 that God has given certain gifts unto men to be teachers and pastors and to be able to help the perfecting of the saints and to teach so that you don't get deceived. Because if you think you have nothing to learn from anyone else, then think again. And I'm not standing here today saying that I don't have anything else to learn. But I do have stuff to teach. I do have something to offer other people. We all need to be ready to learn. And not so puffed up and full of ourselves that we think that you've got everything figured out and what do you need anyone else for? That's core attitude. That's Dathan and Abiram attitude. Verse 15 again, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. God wants the body, which is the church, to continue to increase and help each other out, which is what this is saying. The official working of every measure, every part, increasing the body and edifying itself in love. We encourage one another, all the different members of the body is an encouragement to the others so that the whole body can function to its optimal capacity. 
and we could do the most for the Lord. Church is important. What body are you a part of if you're sitting at home? Unless you believe in the universal church, a Catholic church, the invisible church, your invisible body with your in invisible edifying because it's not happening. And don't, don't get caught up in this, well, I don't know if I have anything to offer. You know what? You being here has something to offer. You just showing up to church has something to offer. I know it does for me. You know what? I'm way more encouraged when we have a lot of people sitting out here than when we have very few people sitting out here. Amen. It encourages me quite a bit. That edifies me a lot. Amen. And you know what? I would believe that you all feel the same way because I know when the roles, were, when I was sitting in the pews, when I was sitting in the seats, I loved having more brothers and sisters in Christ around me. Amen. And the singing is more powerful. Yeah. And the preaching becomes more powerful. And the church becomes more powerful because there's more people here. The body has just grown and is able to do that much more. And how much more exciting is it when you're able to do greater and greater works? It just adds fuel. I mean, this is so much more exciting. I mean, hey, it's great when one soul gets saved, isn't it? It's great. Amen. I love it when one soul gets saved. But how about when 10 souls get saved? How much more exciting is that? How about when 20? How about when 100? How about when 500? It continues to just get better and better and better the more you have. But you know what? We're not operating at complete full strength when there's people forsaking the assembling of themselves together. And according to Psalm 43, which we're going back to, you're not going to church, you're not letting the word, you're not letting the light and the truth lead you because that leads to the house of God. Verse number four, then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. One more benefit to coming to church. How about the joy that comes along with going to church? That's right. It's good. I mean, you're lacking when you're not coming in and experiencing the joy. Joy here, he's not saying, oh, and I go to church and I have to sing. No, I sing because I have joy. I sing because we're gathered together because Jesus Christ is great and worthy to be praised. And we're going to praise his name. It's exciting. And hopefully that's a heart that you have. Verse 5, again, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? I know I spent a lot of time kind of going more, way more in depth on some of these things. But even just after these two verses about the light and the truth, bringing me to tabernacles and the joy... Doesn't it just seem a, 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 in a little bit different light than it did in verse 2 when he said, Why art thou cast down? Why go I mourning? Then he talks about the joy of being in the house of the Lord. He talks about the joy of, of praising the Lord. And then finishes up with, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So yes, we have these, these questions here. Well, why, why does it seem like God's forsaken me? Why, why are you casting me off, God? Where are you, God? <laughs> of course, he's right there. I'm the foolish one for forgetting about the joy. I'm the foolish one for forgetting about the deliverer. I'm the one who's, who's not, you know, that's allowing my soul to be disquieted within me. Just hope in God. Hope in God. I shall yet praise him. He's the health of my, my countenance, my face, my appearance, right? God's going to help you and provide that health. And my God, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for these psalms, Lord, and, and for all the great truths that we could learn from them. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you for this body that you've assembled here together, that, that you're the one that places the members into the body. And I pray that you would please help us to grow and to that you would add more members to this body. Help us all to, to fill out the, the parts that you, that where you would have us to be and, and that we can be fully functional and, 
and uh, multifaceted and people doing different jobs so that we can get a lot more done. And Lord, just uh, bless, bless the people here. Help us to be reminded of, of the great joys and truth. And, and I pray that you will please lead us in your light and in the truth. And um, we love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.